Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beal and Sintan as part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. Took four hours and 22 minutes, Steve, but we got the quarterfinal that everybody uh, first looked at when the draw was out with Rafa getting the fifth seed, um, which is kind of crazy in itself. But there was the potential quarterfinal with Rafa Novak. We're there. We're recording a couple hours after an un- a really, really good match, five set battle. Um, between Felix Agir, Ali Asim, Rafael Nadal. Rafa went in 6-3 in the fifth. I will, I will say this about FAA. His last four slams, he's been quarterfinals, semis, quarterfinal, and now round of 16. And you all know in Australia, I think he served for the match against Medvedev. Um, just came up short on, on that. Felix is a stud. Yeah. He's gonna get had- over this hump. He's going to get over the hump very soon. Yeah, he had a match point in the match that you're yeah. referring to. And so that was that was kind of bad luck for Felix not to get through that. And he stayed, that was in the fourth set. He still had stayed very competitive in the fifth with Medvedev. He's done a great job because he had lost decisively to Medvedev in the U.S. Open semi. And then he darn near beats him in Melbourne. And now, right, just the draw is the only thing that stopped him from going a little further. And he was just a whisker away from it today. So he is now proving himself, David, to be a true big occasion player. He can be a little better week in, week out, and he knows it. He has his lulls. He has his slumps. But, boy, does he get up for these majors. And he's showing now, because he also had a really good match with Novak in in Rome Mm -hmm. that was five and six, that he can play with the big guys now, that he doesn't fear any of them. And this was a difficult psychological match, playing Rafa, the whole story, the back story, as we know, with Uncle Tony coaching him. But he went out there and and won, played a really good first set while Rafa was struggling to find his range. And the next Felix was up 5-1 and then finally won at 6-3. You thought Rafa had taken over, David, when he won the next two sets. Turned the corner to break Felix to go up 5-3 in the second, won that 6-3, won the third 6-2. And as he, as he obviously alluded to in his interview with John Wertheim on Tennis Channel, I think he really, he didn't say he thought he had him. He just was upset with himself for losing his serve from 40 love up at the start of the four set after having had a chance to break Felix in the previous game. And then he still breaks back, but loses his serve again. Felix closed that four set out beautifully, David, with a love hold on his serve and a great. How well did he serve today? He served served really well. He served extremely well, particularly, I thought, that wide slice to wrap his back in in the deuce court. He was killing him with that, sometimes serving and volleying on that, but if not, opening the court up. And obviously, I think that's really the that's where all the great servers try to serve Rafa. You have to do it skillfully. You've got to be deadly accurate with it. But if you pull him wide enough, and Felix did, you can do some damage because Rafa is so far back. But no, it was a great performance from Felix. What the best part of it was, you thought he, he might be gone at the start of the fourth, not, not psychologically gone, but just getting outplayed and Rafa would run the match out and win comfortably in four. And, it and we've seen that so many times, right? And Jim Courier even calls it the, you know, the Rafa becomes the boa constrictor, right? You play yeah. him close, you maybe win a set, and then Rafa gets going, he wins the second, he wins the third, and he's like that boa constrictor. I think it was great for tennis fans that Felix did not go away and it, it, no, it made for but- a very enticing fifth set. Absolutely. And you could tell that Rafa was perturbed about it afterwards. He was a little, he wasn't, he, I don't think he was being disrespectful of Felix, but he was being very hard on himself for, for losing his serve from 40 love, but Felix stayed in that game. And then he still had to break him a second time. And then the way that Felix served out the four set with a love hole was just spectacular. Then the problem for him David was that Rafa starts serving in the fifth. Rafa never was pushed beyond 30 on his serve in the entire fifth seven, never even to deuce. So he was putting constant pressure on Felix, who fended off a break point in the second game of the fifth and another tough hold later before finally losing his serve to go down 5-3. And then Rafa closed it out with uh, just uh, with great grace and 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 confidence. So if, if it, the viewers didn't see the break point at four three, it was a good point by both players, and Rafa made a magnificent shot. Uh, the point was pretty. Uh, it wasn't the 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 one the shot that won the point wasn't a magnificent shot. It was the point in general that Rafa got the break. So if you haven't well, seen that point, go watch it. It's great. Yeah, because he used a really cagey little chip backhand pass to make. And so he kind of realized that Felix would have no alternative but to play a little angle drop volley. And Rafa was onto that 
and then chipped it right past Felix for the winner. It, it, it was a crafty point from Rafa with, with Felix attacking it. Typical of Ratchet, Rafa's ingenuity on the court and his creativity. He doesn't get enough credit for that. He's always thinking and probing and figuring things out on the fly, and he sure did that there. And then, then of course, served it out with great confidence in the last game. So here we are, uh, David, round 59, Djokovic versus Nadal. 30-28 for Novak. Novak, this is also their 10th meeting at Roland Garros. And this is also, David, where the rivalry started in this same round 16 years ago. Novak lost the first two sets to Rafa 4-4 four and four, and then retired, the, the, which happened to him in those days. Mm. Little injuries and ailments that could put him off. And, he did, and, and sometimes he would default at those stages or retire. Uh, but that was the start of the rivalry. And here we are with round 10 at Roland Garros. It's just, you know, it, on the other hand, that's the positive side. The negative side is you really don't want to see either one of these guys losing in the quarterfinals. And as we discussed prior to the tournament, David, in our discussion with Jan Michael Gamble, I think uh, if there had been justice, Rafa, as a 13-time champion, who won his most recent title only two years ago, who, who was lost to Novak in the semis last year. He should have been seated in the top four. And then mm-hmm. this wouldn't, but so be it. The positive side is the fans are in for an incredible treat on Tuesday when these two icons collide in the quarterfinals. Yeah. And just to add what you said, you know, the last two French opens they played, Rafa won the final in 2020 pretty easily. And then last year in the semi, they had that unbelievable third set where Novak won an uh, incredible third set tiebreaker. Novak wound up winning in four sets. You know, Rafa is 7-2 and two at Roland Garros against Novak, but Rafa has only lost three times in Roland Garros, twice to Novak. So Novak is not intimidated. You even heard oh. Novak in the press conference today while Rafa and FAA were playing. Um, Novak said he was totally confident against either one of those individuals. I'll echo what you say. I think we're all a little sad that it's happening at a quarterfinal instead of a, a, a semi or a final, but it is what it is. And, you know, ah, you're so le- you're, you're leery to bet against Rafa at a place that he has owned through for his career. But I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not forcing you to predict it, but uh, mm, I fear, and we don't bet on this podcast, but you got to think Novak is a slight favorite, especially Novak has now had enough matches, you know, with so many starts and stops with everything, with Australia and everything. Um, He's now worked his way in. Uh, He's played some good, played a lot of clay court matches now leading up to it. He played that great match with Carlos um, Alcaraz. He's now getting his feet wet into the tournament. He's playing very well. Um, Slight favorite, Novak? Yeah, I, the other day, prior to this, prior to Novak, polishing off Diego Schwartzman so uh, impressively, 6-1, 6-3, 6-3, losing a serve only once in three sets, recovering from three love down in the second set to win six games in a row to finish off that set. I might have called it even 50-50, but I think the combination of Novak, who who went through Rome, I mean, look look at where he's come from. You alluded to it, but let's just remind the listeners a little bit. He loses in, in a, it, he didn't even look remotely like the real Novak Djokovic in lose, losing to Davidovich Fokina in his opening match in Monte Carlo. Uh, way out of sorts and tired, Admit, admitted he was very fatigued in losing the third set so swiftly. Then he goes to Serbia and he won four three set match. He played four matches and won a string of three setters, but in the final against Rublev, he faded again in the final set and admitted he was fatigued. So, Something wasn't entirely right. Then he goes and loses to Carlos Alcaraz in an epic, but played really well in defeat in the semis of Madrid and goes through Rome without losing a set, beating Tsitsipas in the final. He has not lost a set thus far here in Roland Garros. So as he alluded to in the press conference, David, he that he's happy that he hasn't taken more out of himself. He's been very efficient with his time and his performances on the court. So that's the positive for Nova. Then you have Rafa and his unbelievable, astonishing history at Roland Garros with the 13 titles, with with the just the the incredible kind of historical know-how and feel that he has for this place. So that's why you just that's why you still have to make it really close going in. Uh, uh, The other the other element is how well does he recover? He is going to be 36 next week. 
and he's in incredible shape. But this was four hours and over four hours and 20 minutes, as you alluded to. It was a very physical taxing match. Novak hasn't gone through that. So now Rafa has the day to recover, but will he be at full tilt physically for Novak? He needs, he needs to be to win it. So I would say you, you, don't, you don't want to ever uh, predict with any confidence. Here's what I would say. Two years ago, I thought Novak was going to win, David. He'd had the better year. Rafa had lost to Schwartzman in Rome. And Rafa had been talking about how he didn't like the cooler conditions in the fall, playing in Roland Garros in the fall versus the spring. And he went through Novak in straight sets. Brilliant performance from him and a, a definitely a subpar Novak. Last year, the feeling, the, the prevailing view among most was that this Rafa was going to win in the semis. Despite and the, the first fact set started very similar to what happened in 2020. Started identically. And both times it was a five love lead for Rafa in the first set. The difference this time last year was that Novak came back and won three games and got his teeth into the match better than he had the year before. But but again, I think the prevailing view then was that Rafa would win. The year before, Novak would win. So, you know, there there have been some surprises the last two years. I have to throw that into the mix. All things being equal, slight edge to Novak Djokovic, but I can't wait to see it. I, I can't believe it personally that I've uttered those words on a podcast that Rafa is a slight underdog in Roland Garros. I never thought I would utter those words in a podcast, but like you said, all things considered and Novak, it just speaks to how great Novak is. Um, fascinating to watch what's going to occur. Fascinating. The pride on both sides of the net is going to be there too. I mean, Rafa, I think Rafa knows that a lot of people like us and other players that there are a lot of people who are probably saying right now, well, you know, he didn't have his usual success on the clay on his way to Paris. He got injured. He had the foot problem when he lost to Shapovalov in Rome and the kid beat him. Alcaraz knocks him up in Madrid. And is he is is Rafa really Rafa? Well, until this match with Felix, he had not lost a set and he was looking fine. The foot seems to be OK. We don't know for sure how he comes out of this match. That's another thing you have to ask. Will it start acting up after such a marathon contest today? But phys he seemed physically sprightly in the fifth set. Sprightly. It was amazing how he moved. And there was no sign of any uh, foot ailment, which is good news for everybody. So you hope that physically he's right. You hope Novak stays at the same level. And then maybe we can get something resembling last year, especially the third set of last year's clash. Maybe we can get a series of sets like that. and then the fans are in for a treat. Yeah, for you U.S. fans, it's it's most likely going to be the night match, I think, Tuesday night in Ah, uh, now that's, a, that's an interesting thing you're pointing out, David. I can assure you one thing. Rafael Nadal will fight that match being at night to the hilt. He will yeah. fight against that. Whether he wins, I don't know. He doesn't want it at night. We all know he prefers the heat and the daytime. He feels it gets greater so-called purchase out of his forehand, the ball bounding up higher with the topspin. He's always been happier in the heat. Djokovic would be more than happy to play it in the evening. So that's going to be an interesting dilemma for the, for the organizers at Roland Garros. Will they just go ahead and let it be played as a mid-afternoon contest or, or make it the evening clash? We, we, we don't know as we speak. Yeah, I'm guessing it, and for those in the U.S., make sure maybe late afternoon you're, you free up your plans because I think it's going to be an evening match in, uh, in Paris. But we'll see. Uh, oh, God, we all can't wait to see how that match is going to unfold. I want to go to um, the women's job because for the men, there's been a few upsets, but nothing crazy, crazy, crazy. And the women's draw, there were upsets all over. Just to give you an idea, in the first round, the second seed, the fifth seed, the sixth seed, and the tenth seed all lost in the first round. The biggest one of those, I think, was the sixth seed is Ange DeBoer, who has played so well, so consistently and so well leading up to the tournament. That was a very that was a surprise to me. And then you go to the second round, and I've spoken so highly of her. I I I told you that I think she may I, I predicted that she would win a slam this year. With all the upsets in the first round, I was even more confident. For Maria Sakkari, she loses in the second round. Um, well, I wanted to say one thing about Maria Sakkari. I, I think the listeners probably enjoy this for a change. You and I so often think alike, uh, so often are in accord. I'm a little more worried about Sakkari than you are. I have been all along in the sense of just big matches, big moments, closing out matches. The match she lost a while back to 
Jabor from a set in five two was killing her and she couldn't close her out. She there's there's some there's some stumbling blocks for her psychologically. And I hope I'm wrong, by the way, because I find her very appealing, great for the women's game. And I would much rather see her start winning majors and prove me wrong. But right now I still have a few lingering doubts about her, David. And unfortunately, you know, she didn't live up to her own expectations again here. As for Jabor, yeah, I think maybe that had to be a, a, a jarring because she came in with high hopes and she'd been playing so well, playing the best clay court tennis of her life and seemingly almost as comfortable now on the dirt as she is on the faster court. So that had to be, I know, fortunately for her, Wimbledon's around the corner, but I know she must be deeply disappointed. There, there, yeah, I think we were all surprised with that result with, with Ons. But speaking of an interesting match, and I don't think we, I don't think we, many people would have predicted this quarterfinal match: Coco Goff and Sloane Stevens. Um, it's it's kind of uh, Sloan is so it, it, it's hard to predict, and we've said we've talked about Sloan and Madison Keys quite a bit in these episodes, and we're both. We're, we're both fans of both. It's just the, the inconsistency, the up and down results of both Sloan and Madison. Both are still alive in this tournament. Um, Madison won a big match, 7-6 in the third uh, yesterday. We're recording this on Sunday, so it was yesterday. Sloan Stevens just destroyed a very good Jill Teichman today, 6-2, six, 6 love. Not so much surprised that Sloan won. And the fact that she won 6-2-6 six, love, I don't think many people saw that. She now plays Coco Goff, who is rounding into form. She played very well the second set today. How do you see that quarterfinal match going? Uh, you, you remember that, that Sloan really gave her uh, Coco sort of a schooling and a lesson at the U.S. Open. Uh, whether she can replicate that, I don't know. But I do believe that what you just alluded to is, is important. You know, the first couple of rounds here, she's coming from behind. She's in danger. She had some good wins. And now the last two rounds, straight set wins. And to beat Teichman, two in love is crazy. crazy. Nobody saw like that coming. So that's got to fuel Sloan with a lot of confidence. On the other hand, she knows that Coco is steadily improving. She knows how Coco may have learned something from their last meeting. I, I see this one as a pretty tight three-setter either way, frankly. I, I, I don't lean heavily toward either one. I might, I might actually give Coco a slight edge this time, but I love the way Sloan is performing, and it's, it's good to see her back in that intense, confident state uh, where she's playing her best tennis, because as you know, she's been in the finals here before, and then she, that was the year after she won the 2017 U.S. Open. So Sloan really knows what she's doing on the clay, but Coco is improving with the is, she's been very impressive here who can yeah. fold her for the, been playing at rolling garros no i agree and we have another american on the top half of the draw jesse pagula and she's been playing really well too um the 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 men the american men you know you could you could say it was a little bit disappointing um this fortnight at least the first week but the women have been there's been plenty of women still playing great and alive and Again, Jesse Pagula is playing really well. Um, I don't know if anyone is going to beat Iga Swiatek. I mean, there's no signs of her slowing down at all. I mean, she's the clear-cut favorite in your eyes, right, Steve? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, in her third-round match, she actually had the audacity to go 6-3-7-5, and people were talking about the match as if she'd been pushed to 7-6 in the third. I mean, that's how good she is now that you're shocked if she has. And the second set of that third rounder, she was up 4-1 in a couple of breaks and then lost four games in a row and finally did close it out from there. No, I don't see anybody. I feel pretty confident picking her to win the title. I, I, I don't, unless there's a sudden sort of anxiety attack near the end, but she's, she's been on such a roll and there's no reason to believe her winning streak will come to an end here. And she'd be very worthy champion if she took this title for the second time. I like her chances. Uh, I want to say this, and I want to talk about the draw again, because again, like you, you reiterate, I mean, the fifth seed with Rafa is kind of, it's just crazy. You, you don't think it would happen. And I will ask you this, Steve, and you've covered so many tournaments. You've, you've analyzed so many draws over the course of your career. If Rafa can beat Felix Ajir Ali Asim over four hours, then beats Novak Djokovic in the quarters, possibly, Carlos Alcaraz is playing catching off right now. As time of recording, Carlos is up a set in that one. No, so he's he actually, would possibly play. Now he's up play. two sets. 
Two sets second. of love now. He yeah. would possibly play Carlos Alcaraz in the semi and then possibly Tsitsipas or Medvedev in the final. If Rafa were to win his 14th Roland Garros, beating those players that I just listed, would this be the most remarkable achievement of his career? You could argue that. I think similarly, you could argue that if Djokovic beat Nadal, even a slightly fatigued Rafa, if he's not at his very best, it's still Rafa. If he were to beat Rafa, avenge his loss to Carlos from Madrid and beat him in the semis and then repeat his win over Tsitsipas in the final from a year ago, that would I think he'd rank that one pretty high among his achievements too at any major. So there that's but you see, it gets back to the same point, David. It's like, should they have to do that? Fair enough. Draws can fall any way. It, it happens. But should they have been put in that position? Probably not. They're just going to have to deal with it. And I know that each of them is going into that match, not only hoping they can win, but hoping they can get through it in no more than four sets and not have it be uh, ridiculously long, not have it approach five hours and have to worry about recovering from that kind of a physical battle. And, and in the back of their minds, I know, I know they, they're not going to get ahead of themselves, but they, they really want to be at their best in that match so that they, there's something left for the big semifinal. Because it's got to be a strange feeling for whoever comes off the court to realize that there would not only be one more. I mean, a year ago, at least Novak knew, OK, I beat Rafa in four hours and 11 minutes, I believe it was. And, and now I still got to play Stefanos. But it's just Stefanos, one more match. I think I can do it. This time, whoever comes off the court, the winner is going to have to deal with the hottest player in the game, probably, most likely, as long as Alcaraz beats Zarev, and then follow it up with a, with a Sitsipas or a Medvedev, as you pointed out. So they're both in a tough spot. Now, you see, if Djokovic had been fortunate and Felix had managed to beat Rafa, that wouldn't have been an easy match, but it wouldn't have been the, it wouldn't have been the same strenuous combination of physical and psychological resources for him it would have been a little different this one they know they they know they're going to spill their guts out there as they do every time they play each other uh, this will be no exception no i agree and we mentioned to it because I, I you mentioned to it and i want to hit on it briefly um alcaraz like you said is up two sets of love right now over uh Karin Gachinov. he will be playing zverev you know that's a pretend that that's a rematch of the madrid final um Zverev, you know, they didn't get a lot of sleep, I think, for two matches in a row in that. Um, that was a, that was a beatdown by Alcaraz. I don't think, uh, while Alcaraz may win, I don't think it will be as much of a route as it was. Zverev's playing pretty well. Um, you give Zverev a chance or you're going Carlos in that pretty easy. Now, I, I, that I see just the way you described it. It's not going to be that kind of one-sided contest that we saw. And and by the way, I was a little disappointed in Zverev. He, he I felt like he whined a little bit after that about the scheduling because they all get put in that position where somebody gets the night match, has to come back and play the final the next day against the player who played the day match. And yes, it's an advantage, but he got destroyed that day. I agree. I don't see a destruction like that, but I see a Carlos probably in four sets. I still don't see a total turnaround where Zarev serves him off the court, uh, but I see him playing well enough to extend it to four. Uh, I really like Alcaraz's chances, assuming that he finishes off this match with Hachinov. And then, and then we'd have that dream semi, no matter what it was, of Djokovic or Nadal versus Alcaraz. So that, that I can't wait for that one, too. Stay tuned, tennis fans. We're going to have some great tennis coming up, I mean, this second week. Just, uh, just such great stuff. And thanks, Steve. We're going to talk uh, next weekend, and we'll see where we're at because uh, – we're going to digest a uh, we're going to digest a lot of a heck of a good tennis a heck of good tennis this second week it's going to be pretty crazy it'll be something Looking. thanks steve thank you david yeah look forward to the next one who knows whom we'll be talking about but it will be a, it'll be a great storyline particularly for the men and and i still think it's a terrific story if Swiatek lives up to her billing and validates her number 1 status and captures the second major and then, and because I happen to think that's just what women's tennis needs, continuity. And that doesn't mean she has to win every slam she plays, but I think it would be a nice validation for her right now to win her second Roland Garros.
And look out, it may not be shocking if Coco Goff is playing in the finals of the French Open. I'll leave everyone with that. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you, David. Enjoyed it.